you're changing ghosts into ancestors. And you probably have heard me say this before, but the if it's inside of you, it haunts, it's a ghost and it haunts you. That's what's going to get you into a bar fight. That's what's going to get you divorced. That's what's going to get you screaming at your kids. All those things are because these experiences that you've had affect you. And the more you push them down inside, the where you're not aware of them, they're going to haunt you. That's so how do you get it outside of you? How do you turn it into an ancestor? You get it out in front of you where you can look at it. And that's what the piece of art is. That's what the writing is. That's what the music is. Uh, is that you take that ghost that's been haunting you and you put it out in front of you and make it conscious. It'll never go away. I mean, that experience is the experience you had. And believe me, some of the things that I did in the war, I wish I hadn't done. But when I get out, get it out and look at it it doesn't compel me to do really bad things today <laughs> you know I, I i can look at it as an ancestor it's part of my makeup but it's not haunting me because i've tried to repress it uh and i think that it's an important concept ghosts to ancestors and and there's many ways of turning your ghosts into ancestors i mean including you know just talking with your wife about it i mean you think that'd be something everybody does but i've I guarantee you that 80% of veterans come back and never say a word to their wives about what, any of that stuff. Hey team, check it out. Today we welcome Mr. Carl Melantis. Mr. Melantis is the critically acclaimed author of Matterhorn, What It's Like to Go to War in Deep River. All of his works are inspired by his service in the Vietnam War as the platoon commander with 1st Battalion, 4th Marines, where he heroically led an assault on a hilltop bunker complex, earning the Navy Cross. His openness and his experiences during the war and connection with fellow Marines have become an inspiration for leaders of all ranks through multiple generations of conflict. Well, you know, I was wondering if, uh, you know, we could kind of start from the beginning as you, as you tell your story. Um, I understand as, you know, you, you grew up, you, it was really a, a impressed upon based on you seeing former individuals that had grown up in your town that had want, well, gone off and joined the Marines and you came back and you were kind of all inspired that, you know, a little bit, you know, wider shoulders, broader chested, and, and they had some adventure and some a little bit different different look in their eyes. I was wondering if you could share that with the team. Sure. Okay, I mean, little town, there were like uh, 30 or 35 boys in my class, you know, a little tiny high school. And, uh, you know, the, I think what people really don't understand today is the draft. Um, that hung over everybody's, every boy's head. And uh, it was like, you know, if you don't go to college and get a 2S deferment and or uh, uh, join the, the service that you want, you're going to get drafted and then you have no choice. And uh, so that was part of it. The other part of it was um, there was virtually everybody's dad or uncle. I mean, I, I don't know hardly any guys in the town except people who were deferred because they were loggers. It was a critical industry who didn't serve in World War II. And so um, you had this incredible sort of sense of, uh, well, I got to sort of keep the, the it, it just sort of, it, it was like paying taxes. Uh, nobody likes to pay taxes. I mean, I don't. But the fact of the matter is, is that you know, the Republic won't work unless we pay our taxes. And so getting drafted was like, oh, well, okay, I owe it. You sort of felt like you owed it to the country because you were a, a member. So all that was in the background. And um, then there was also the aspect of, of service. And I think that's changed a little bit with the all volunteer military. Uh, I like to say that our language is important. We we used to, everybody used to refer to as that was when your dad was in the service that was when your uncle was in the service it's, it's called the military now it's a big change and uh, again it's because it's not like taxes anymore it's like oh it's another career uh and that's something that has to be thought about you know i mean i think it, i i would like to see national service and then out of that pool people volunteering for the military part of national service uh, that's my p politics but anyway, so here you are, you're 17 years old in this little town on the coast of Oregon, and mostly the football players all joined the Marine Corps, because that was sort of the thing, you know, and, and you know, could you, could you make it through, through boot camp? And honest to God, I mean, they'd come back with something that we never saw called a suntan, and uh, because they all went to San Diego. 
and they were and they would swagger around. I mean, they you know just swagger up and down this little town of ours, and 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 so in ter in addition to patriotism and what you owe your country and the idea of service, there was just manhood. There was just sort of like I want some of that. I want to be like that. I want to I want to have that swagger. I want to I want to say that you know you know I, I'm in the infantry. I mean, it's a big deal. You know, and. Uh, so all of that combined, and so when, when I left high school, I joined a uh, program that the Marines had called PLC, Platoon Leaders Class. And it was a great program in that you didn't have to do ROTC in college. You didn't have to, you know, wear uniforms or do aimless marching up and down the football fields. <laughs> but uh, you could, uh, you would go to, go, you went through boot camp and they tried to weed you out. And if you survived that summer, then you got into the program as enlisted uh, in the Marine Corps Reserve. And then you'd go back in the summers. And when you graduated from college, uh, then you, you got your commission. You didn't have to go to, to uh, what was it called? Um, uh, oh, <laughs> Officer Candidate School, you know, or, or the Naval Academy, which is the other entry for for the marine corps and uh so i had that's what i joined and i all through the early six the mid 60s i was i was in that program and i graduated from yale in 67 and that war was just you know full on man and all the services were short of junior officers and i thought i'd never get a chance uh, to go take the scholarship the road scholarship but I, I wrote to the Marines and I said, I won the scholarship. I wondered if I could defer entering. And I thought the odds of that were almost zero, but they let me go. And I told this story before, once I was over there in England, I just started to feel guilty. I mean, I'd served with these guys, five kids, like this tiny high school, five boys died over in Vietnam. And here I was, you know, drinking beer, hanging out with the girls. And, and I, I just couldn't do it. And it, it had nothing at that point to do with patriotism. I mean, I thought the war was a mess. I mean, it just didn't make sense to me, but I, I had, I'd raised my hand, sworn to God that I would, you know, defend the constitution. And uh, if the president of the United States says you're going to go over here and fight, that's it. That's the, that's the constitution. It, it, you're either in or not. And it's a big, big deal for military people. I think they really have to think carefully about that. I've come down on the side that if you're not willing to serve that way uh, you better not be there because you can't i mean i use this analogy of of a rifle suppose you had a rifle whose each individual part could decide whether they wanted to function on any particular day but you wouldn't have a rifle i mean it would be just silly the military has to have people who have who have committed to doing what uh is asked of them or they need to go. And I saw a bunch of questions here about meaning, and that's that's a big part of it. How do you find meaning when, when you've already committed yourself to something where, in fact, as was the case, in my opinion, in Vietnam, it was an error. It was a, it was a policy mistake, and we were over there killing people and getting killed for what I finally decided was no good reason. But there's an overarching reason, which is that I'd signed on. And I, I never regret, never regret it. You, you know, sir, that's, you know, just for everybody that just kind of understand it and kind of set the scene, you, you talk about the draft, you know, you're coming from this small town on the West, on the West coast, your dad's the principal, you know, so the value of education, obviously, as you've gone through and you end up becoming a Rhodes scholar, you make your way to Yale and get accepted to be a, a Rhodes scholar. But somewhere along this line, there's this identification with, you know, doing something bigger than yourself. And so, you know, I, I thought that was pretty interesting because especially as, you know, we talk about an all-volunteer force now, and I've mentioned this before, as I was getting ready to go into command, they talked about this statistic about, you know, I think at this time it was about 35 to 38, you know, roughly under 40% between the ages of 18 to 25 were even physically able, you know, whether it was a physical or a mental capacity to even serve and enlist. And so, you know, as, as you're going through this, you're recognizing this, and you're just your small town, your small world. You're an athlete. You've got a little bit of that mindset. You understand the value of education. You have opportunities. It wasn't one of those things that says, hey, I, I've got to do this. 
Um, I didn't get the impression from what I understood and, and read about you that there was any pressure to do that. Where do you get this value set, you know, to recognize, to do something bigger than yourself at, at, a, at this young an age? Well, you know, it, I think, first of all, there's your parents, you know, I mean, that I was, I had two adults as parents <laughs> and there's not a whole lot of people who can say that. Uh, and, and they had, they had uh, instilled in me the idea that you're part of a bigger group, you know? Uh, and, um, I think that the other, the other thing was, was sports playing football. I mean, you know, you, you cannot underestimate the value of, of of being on a team uh, it, it, when you're young. You realize, that, oh, if I don't do my part, we don't win. And if I do do my part, I can't do my part without the other 10 guys. I mean, it, it, that's those are lessons that you learn without even knowing you're learning lessons. But I think all of that is in the background. I think the other thing is that <laughs> I get a little sort of mystical here, but your own, I, I, I call it the soul, I don't care what you want to call it, the psyche, or, you know, it depends on, on your religious values, but I call it the soul, and I think we know what I'm talking about. It has its own path that it wants to follow. And uh, there's a wonderful quote from uh, Carl Jung, who is a psychologist that I love to read, and he said, isn't it a pity that uh, people go kicking and screaming to the place where destiny would take them anyway? And that's that idea that, that you, there is an inner guidance in you that, that, and when you're 17 and 18, you are really not aware of it. Uh, but it's, it's guiding you. It's, it's sort of moving you along. And uh, I, 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 this tiny little library in Seaside, it was, it was next to the fire truck. The fire truck was, it was in one side of this building and the library was on the other side. But there was a book there called The Story of the U.S. Marines. And I picked that book up when I was about nine. And I read it probably 20 times. Why, what's that? See, that's not logic. That's just, that's some, something in me was pushing me in that direction. And if you came, you know, on the planet to, to be a warrior, to, you know, be in, be in the army or the Marines or the Navy, whatever, uh, it'll, it, you'll end up there. <laughs> you will, and I so so all those things combined. So I mean, there's obviously it's it's a, it's an easy question to ask, and I don't think there's a simple answer, but it, it revolves around these combinations of sports, parenting, and this sort of guidance that you you get from your own from your own soul that, that moves you in the right direction, and all of that, I have come to understand that becoming an adult is when you switch from being self-oriented toward being other oriented that's the whole er character arc of Mellis in in Matterhorn he starts out just thinking about himself it's like geez I lost a guy how am I going to fill him in because I need to run the platoon and uh well maybe I'll get a medal and you know because then I'll go home and I'll run for governor and da, 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 da. by the end of the book he he has realized that he can't behave that way ethically. He's got to change his orientation toward others. Otherwise, he's just going to be an empty, empty soul. And uh, uh, so I was dealing with that in Matterhorn, trying to understand that switch. And I, I will often say, well, you know, what makes an adult? And it's clearly that other orientation. And a lot of that is forced on us. I mean, you have kids. <laughs> I mean, you know, at two in the morning, you don't want to get up. But the baby's crying, you know, so you, you're almost forced by nature to be other oriented. But that's an important part of it. And as you well know, and any, anybody in the military must know and understand, your focus has to be totally outward toward the unit, not inward to, toward yourself. That sort of stuff you can do later, but when, in terms of your, your job, it's got to be for the other people. Um, it doesn't work any other way. I think that's uh, that's incredibly reflective and, and some great insights are, and, and you know, it's actually, it's, it's common messages that we've heard from previous guests when we ask this, you know, 
And I even, as I've heard some of this discussion, I, I remember going back to asking my dad, you know, as I joined the military and then continued along what we call the profession of arms or the journey of profession of arms, this repetitive professional judgment to manage, you know, for repetitive professional uh, judgments to manage two things, violence and risk. I remember asking him the question, did you have a plan or did you think or did you want me to end up doing this? You know, was this kind of what you had intended for me? And he said, no, I, I've always wanted you, and I've always told you that, you know, I was going to guarantee two things. Number one, I was not going to leave you a lot of money, but I was going to leave you uh, a good set of values and, and a strong work ethic. And with those two things, you could go along and do whatever it is. And I expected wherever you would go that you would lead. And so, you know, when I hear this thing about what the values are imprinted upon you when it comes to parents, and somebody, you know, as, as you are benefited from having two – what I offer to people a lot of times, because I echo the same thing, when you have kids and, and whoever you choose to spend the rest of your life with, you know, there are, there are attributes and, and things that you, you absolutely love. And there's some things that, you know, OK, I can I can I can work with, you know, but, you know, those things you can work with that you also learn to love. Um, once you have kids, those are already passed down, the best of us and the worst of us. And you can see them manifesting every day in the personalities of your kids. Yeah. Um, and so a lot of times I remember listening, you know, to, to Adam Grant one time and he was talking about he had no idea what his parents had, had done, you know, behavior psychology and all this. And, you know, he has this interest. And so you, you talk about that third part about it. it's almost this calling. So maybe it's, you know, parents kind of have this thing where they teach you your values, right and wrong, strong work ethic, discipline, the value of education, hard work, rewards, achievement, all those kind of things. Um, do your best, strive to be better, help others, be a good person, golden rule, all that kind of stuff. Um, and then you go out and say, hey, be a good person about being a good teammate. Hey, what, what better way to apply that than being on, on, on something oriented in sports where there is a condition of competition, where there is a challenge, there is some heated emotion, there is pressure. Um, and you see your, yourself kind of, you know, as you go through these emotions and those that coach you through these things, you learn a little bit about yourself. You learn to deal with loss. You learn to yeah. deal with defeat. Um, and, and I wasn't the best of that when I was growing up, you know, I, I can, my parents can attest to that, you know, very, very often. <laughs> so yeah, yes, sir. You raised something that just triggered a thought that, that I, I, you said about a calling and you know, usually you apply that to like the ministry or something, but I think it's an important distinction between a calling and a career. Joining the military, yes, you could say it's a career because you spend so much time and there's a pension at the end and you get paid for it. But if you do it from the aspect of, oh, this is going to be good for my pocketbook and this is going to be good for my retirement, you're doing it for the wrong reasons. That's right. If you're doing, the military is different than other professions. That's right. How? The, in the military, you kill people. That is the difference. And intentionally kill people. Huge difference. If you're doing that for a retirement or for, or for a, a paycheck, you're an assassin. That's what an assassin is, someone who kills for money. And so if you're in the military as a career, I think you should get out. You should find a career with Microsoft or something. And that's perfectly legitimate because Microsoft isn't in the business of killing people. And I think that, that people sometimes don't think very deeply about why am I here and what's my attitude toward it? Yeah, you need to get paid. You have to send your kids to school. All that stuff has to happen. But fundamentally, you can't see it as a career. You have to see it as a calling. Otherwise, I think you're immoral. A absolutely, sir. You know, w when you go through the... Uh... The, the pre-command course, you, you you work an exercise to try to term, determine what your core purpose is. And, you know, uh, the thing I really appreciated in your discussion is, you know, and, and that I was impressed upon was the fact that, you know, at, at 18 years old <clears throat> and really in your early 20s, you, you've been able to look outside, you know, your three-foot, you know, world to see something bigger than yourself. And I, and I know when you're talking policy, 
you know, that's something that is so, you know, almost into the point where at, at that time in your life, it, you know, what I'd offer is policies is based on two things, interest and values. And then that's different than the politics aspect of it. But you still at a very young age are able to see, hey, there's something that I want to do outside of what's important to me, that increased self-awareness. And so something that I, that I like to share is, you know, the first time I went into command, they give us this card. And in this card, you know, they lay out and they, and they essentially, you know, they, they talk about in the, in the center of this is your core purpose. The outside, the circle outside of that is your core values. And then what are the leadership behaviors as you're going through this? So as I was going through this as a battalion commander, you know, I went through and they asked you to list, hey, what are your core values? So I said, hey, you know, faith, family, integrity, dedication, and discipline. And the way I described those leadership behaviors, I said, hey, be resilient and positive with a can-do attitude, unconditional love, be gracious, set the example and use your best judgment, overcome adversity, never quit, and then maintain standards, do good and avoid evil. So then when I went through this and I was kind of thinking, I said, hey, what I believe my core purpose as we get back to this discussion of calling. So be an example of a work ethic and values always dedicated to helping others achieve success. And so it, it goes back to, you know, I, I think that if I had this discussion, you know, and I told my mom and dad, hey, this is what I think my core purpose is. I think they'd have been like, yeah, like those are the things that we were teaching you, you know, since you were like a fetus in shoes, you know? <laughs> so, it, yeah, yes, sir. So the, the, the thing that I wanted to then share with you. So then after being a battalion commander, then after taking my battalion, you know, to combat and then having previous experiences in leading in combat, then I'm getting ready to become a brigade commander. So I have a little bit of different life experience. And I went back through again and I went through the exercise. And so this time I said, Hey, I looked at my core values, and they were gen generally about the same. I defined them with different terms a little bit. So I said family, integrity, loyalty, teamwork, and leadership. Was I kind of said, hey, these are my, my core values. And then I went back and asked myself what I thought was changed a little bit different, and why did I, I say that? And I kind of journaled that portion of it. The behaviors, I said, hey, you know, be available, listen first, always be supportive. That was the first one. Second was be transparent and open, set the example. Three was committed and invested to strengthening relationships and teams. Fourth was being encouraging and inclu inclusive. Number five was inspire, motivate, direct teams to achieve success. So this time, I, you know, when I looked at my core purpose again, they said I, I, I listed it as a live a life investing in building relationships personally and professionally, inspire others to reach their potential and be better every day. So it's, I think it's the, they're, they're very similar, but I think that as I continue to go through and we're having this discussion about calling, I go back and I say, I think this is something that you got to ask yourself, do I have the signpost of what I originally thought? And so, you know, we, we, we talk about, and I really appreciate as we get to, you know, the, the, the meat of the conversation about you writing and going through this cathartic process about sharing your experiences in combat I left West Point and I wrote three pages of what I thought good leadership was. And if you went back to it now, you being, you know, a, 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 a prize winning author, you would laugh hysterically and ask if I <laughs> and, and probably wanted to see my transcripts, you know, to see if I actually graduated from uh, English composition. But, you know, when I wrote that, I, I, I looked at that and, and I was I wasn't tarnished yet and I hadn't had the experiences of combat. Um, and, and I go back and I said, these are the competencies, these are the attributes, these are the intangibles that I, I see good leadership in. And I still have that today. And, and, and what I offer to young leaders and anybody that comes is I say, hey, write something down, because that's the only way you're going to know at that moment, you know, what you truly felt. Because otherwise, you're going to go back and you're going to rationalize and you're going to say, hey, I have the same family. I have the same friends. I still believe this. And then you become my age and you're a colonel and you go, yeah, 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 yeah. I always believe that when yeah, we course. that's right, sir. You know, when we all think like, hey, our, our, our uh, what we actually changed. And I read that every time I leave and get ready to go to another assignment. That's, that's a great document. And, and, and I ask myself. Yes, sir. And I ask myself, if I don't believe this anymore or something has changed, I feel like I have to reconcile that before I can continue along this path. Mm -hmm. 
And, and, and I wanted to share with that with you because this, this great discussion that we're having about calling and you bringing it up, it isn't about careerism, you know, and, and it starts from this discussion of understanding and you recognize it, which is all inspiring to me at a very young age about seeing yourself out of this three foot wall or three foot world to be able to see something bigger than yourself. And so I just wanted to share and you kind of said, you know, uh, in, in your soul, I, I see that as finding your purpose and how that purpose serves, you know, and as instead of calling it a career, like a profession of arms, you know, and, and what we do. And, and really, even though that you depends on how long, it doesn't really matter how long you serve, those that truly are part of the profession and become members and travel along that, you know, strive to be a steward. Steward and stewards love the journey, love to gather those along with them and love to pay it forward. Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's very, very true. And I also have to laugh because I, I had the, when I was in Vietnam, I kept a, a I don't call it a journal, I guess. I mean, I would write in it about every third week or something, but, uh, but I had it and I lost it. I don't know what happened to it. And uh, when my mother died, I was going through all the stuff and there it was. And she kept it. And it's the same. I opened it up and I went, oh my God. God, you know, I mean, the shit that I wrote when I was 22 years old, you know, it's like, oh my God, you know, makes you kind of humble. But on the other hand, you know, it, 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 it's an, it, it is a, a testament in a literal sense to, like you said, putting it down honestly. I, I was writing honestly then, but it looked like a, a, sometimes a whiny child. I was complaining about wet socks, you know. <laughs> seven pages of wet socks but anyway the uh, uh but to see yourself as you were and see that you're developing in the right direction because you could go back and look at a document like that and go i've lost my way that's exactly that's right. another valuable aspect of it uh and i and i do know there are people that lose their way i mean i know guys that that well that i went through you know uh, the basic school with who ended up doing the careerism thing. And uh, I thought made some really dumb choices because it furthered their career. And I hope someday they woke up and, and went, ooh, this is not what I was supposed to be doing. Um, and I, I, I'm a pretty firm believer that if your heart's in the right place, you'll end up in the right place. Maybe it won't be you know, chief of staff, but that's not what your purpose on life was to be. It was It was to be, helping those people that, that you were given responsibility for. And, you know, you could say, well, that just sounds like rationalizing. I mean, I want to be chief of staff, you know, it's like, well, yeah, but sometimes to get there, you may have to do things that when you look at that document you wrote when you were 22, you would go like, oh, yuck. <laughs> so it's a good, it's a good exercise. I mean, I, I, I think it's great. You should, I recommend it. Absolutely. It, it, it has been very cathartic. It, it helps, you know, increase that humility a little bit as you're walking through and, and then you know mentors and and that I've had in the past have offered that you know the downfall of a leader is when he starts to believe his own press when he starts to believe what's written and said about them good or bad and, yeah. and and I think that you know having that as you mentioned almost like a constitution for yourself going back and saying hey do I still believe this you know when I was young I was naive. I, you know, I, I hadn't been uh, invested by non-commissioned officers yet. Had my first experience, nothing with combat. Um, what, what has changed in my life? Um, and, I, and it's interesting, you know, as I, as I look back personally, I know that there are certain things that I've experienced personally and professionally, and I can kind of almost, you know, walk to that and show. And so, you know, I, I the more, the, the older I get now, I, I kind of, the one thing you got to love with, you know, a mother that loves to keep everything that you have, it's a reminder, you know, like you, you weren't very good in grade school or you weren't very good in middle school. <laughs> and, and so, you know, and, and she loves to surprise you and, and share, you know, your, your, your fondest, you know, good things box, you know, at the most inopportune times. So your son opens it up when he's struggling with some type of class and he uses it as a justification is like, why are you getting on me? You got to see in calculus, you know? <laughs> so, 
Isaac, my own mother, she's Finnish, right? The Finns are notoriously, uh, uh, I don't know what the word is, uh, non-emotional. And uh, I, I came home from a track meet. I ran the eight, 880 in those days, 800. And I, I came in and my mom's in the kitchen ironing, and, uh, which is something nobody does today. And she looks up the words and, and I say, Mom, I won eight eight eighty. And she she pauses and says, What? Didn't they bring their best people? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean my wife says that defined my entire life, you know. <laughs> oh, that's great, sir. That's great. Well, you know, I and and as you mentioned, so you actually, you know, you were actually at at uh, Oxford, you know, for a semester. You know, and you didn't think, and you were there, and then your experience in life, you're going through, you're pursuing this education, and you had once written to the Marine Corps saying, hey, can I go and pursue this? But while you're over there, then my understanding is then you wrote them again. Yeah, that's right. No, I, I felt bad, I, and I can, I can only say it was because my friends were over there, and, and ultimately, I think that that's a value that, that should be recognized. Everybody things about, well, I did it because of patriotism, or I did it because I signed, signed an oath to, you know, to uphold the Constitution. Yeah, yeah, but basically, I couldn't let my friends do it without me. I just couldn't sit there and, and say, let them do it. I couldn't do it, and I don't know where that comes from. Could be, like I said, just being on the team. They were over there and I in Vietnam, and I was over there in England where it was a real different situation and I just couldn't do it. I just said, you're just a worthless piece of crap if you don't do what you set out to do. And uh, I'll never forget, I, I, I was at my old high school and giving a talk because of Matterhorn, you know, lo local boy comes back home and all that and, and uh, you know, some girl in the, in the class, in the, uh, it was in the cafeteria, uh, stood up and she says, well, you know, I'd like to know if you'd do it again. And no one asked, I mean, only kids ask you questions that are so profoundly simple. And, and I, I had to stop. And my answer was, um, I would, uh, because it so defined my life and who I am today. And I like who I am today. I couldn't feel right about being who I am today if I hadn't have done that experience. And that goes back to that thing I opened with, which is that somehow there was some guidance, some soul that said, no, if you're gonna be the guy that you really wanna be and be satisfied when you're you know, 75 years old, soon to be 76, um, then you need to do this now. Otherwise, you'll, you won't, when you look in the mirror, you'll, you'll feel a little bit of embarrassment. And, and uh, maybe even shame, and maybe that's appropriate. Uh, so that decision had had something to do with who I really wanted to be. Who who is it? And again, a lot of it's just unconscious. I, I I'd like to take credit that I was thinking that clearly when I was 22 years old. I wasn't, <laughs> but uh, but there was something there. And uh, you know, I, I some friends of mine have kept letters of mine, and and. You know, I have to give myself some credit. I wasn't a complete idiot. I mean, I did have some thoughts that, that were true, and then I'm glad I had, because if I, hadn't, if I hadn't left Oxford, I'd be a different person, and I don't think that I'd feel as good about myself as I do. But that's my circumstances. I mean, I have an older brother. He, he, he died, unfortunately, but um, who thought the war was just stupid and never went. And... Uh, he did his path. You know, I can't say that he chose wrongly. Uh, he went on to run Rockefeller Center Incorporated. He was, a, he was a huge success in business. That was his path. I mean, I just have to think that there, there are paths and uh, uh, I don't have any other answer for it. And I can't, I can't give you any scientific rational reason for it. I just believe it. Well, I think what, what I'd offer, sir, is just listening to your story is, is number one, you, you just sound like you have this this uh, sense of humanity, just being a good person, you know, and understanding the value of, of trying to help somebody else and just knowing, hey, if, if I'm able to, that I'm going to go and, and help somebody else. If I know that they're out there, and, and, that's, and that's one of the, 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 the beginning and the easiest sense of, of leadership. I've heard senior leaders say, you know, if, if it's, uh, the conditions are miserable, 
then be with your soldiers. If it's risky, then lead it. You know, and, and I've heard another senior leader also offer that says, you know, some people say that they do this for country, for patriotism, they may do for their family, but in the end of the day, they're doing it for the individuals to the left and right of them. And, and, I, and I go back to that same thing that, that says, I, I appreciate that you were able to recognize that early on. And, you know, when we talk about different generations today, and, and I hear a lot of this rhetoric where, hey, the generations are different and, you know, they, they learn different now, they receive information, and, and you can never lose sight of the fact that, hey, there's still 18-year-olds that have found a different way and a path which may not be at yours, but for some reason somebody influenced them and, and they made a decision to do something that was voluntary, you know, and, and be part of this less than 1% that now is protecting the 99. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's absolutely true. I, I agree with it. You, you know, sir, so you, you, you end up going into the Marines and you're a, you're a, a lieutenant that goes in there. I was wondering, you know, as I was listening to your own personal story, as you went through a couple of things, I, I was really touched by the story about your RTO, you know, uh, old Charles Thomas. And I was wondering if you could, you know, tell that story and, and really how you credit him saving your life and then talk through uh, Mutter's Ridge. Yeah, yeah. Well, I might plug, there's a wonderful YouTube uh, that, that the AARC put out uh, about that relationship. Uh, the, uh, there was something called My Buddy or something, it was a series, and I talked about Thomas. Uh, Thomas was uh, 19 when I met him. Uh, he'd been in Vietnam 10 months or something like that. Maybe, no, a little less than that because he was with me on 484. So anyway, he'd been there a considerable amount of time. I'd been there no, no amount of time. And, and uh, he was my radio operator. And, uh, <laughs> you know, he, he and I, you know, got, got along really well together. There was always the gap. I mean, he was 19. I'd just turned 23. Uh, and so there was an age gap and I'll never forget talking to one of his friends. We were at a reunion. I said, gosh, I must have looked like a big brother to you guys. And he laughed at me and he said, you look like a father figure to us. You know, it's hard to try and remember that a 23 year old to an 18 year old is thinking about when you were a freshman in high school and what a senior in high school looked like. I mean, trying to remember that, you know. So anyway, Tom, but Thomas and I were close. I mean, you, you can't help but be close. You, you, the radio operator is with you all the time. I mean, you know, I mean, the, the cardinal sin for a radio operator was to not be there when you reached for the handset. I mean, it would just be like, you're done, you're fired, you know, you had to be there. And uh, he and I would come close and, and, and after he got uh, comfortable with me, you know, which was didn't take long. I mean, I'm pretty easy that way. Oh, I have, I have to tell you this story. Sorry to go outside. It's an aside, but it's this great story. So Flaherty, who is the second squad leader, I got to know him, you know, well, and, 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 and after about two or three weeks, everybody in the platoon had pretty much relaxed. They, they knew that I was pretty human. And Flag comes up to me after the end of a pretty arduous patrol, and he says, sir, he says, are they shitting us about you going to Yale and being a Rhodes Scholar? I said, no, Flag, they're not shitting you about it. And he said, well, you must be the dumbest fucking Rhodes Scholar on record. <laughs> but anyway, I had a relationship with these guys. And Thomas would, sometimes I'd start, I'd make an order and Thomas would give me an elbow. Sir, <laughs> you know, and I, all right, you know, and I knew, I mean, he'd been there. He'd been there a long time and he knew shit that I didn't know. I mean, I knew how to call in airstrikes and I knew all the technical stuff, but Things like, you know, well, maybe they're going to be over there instead of over there. That I wasn't savvy about that yet. Uh, and uh, I listened to him. So we had a very close working relationship. And uh, we were in a particularly arduous uh, operation. And we'd been without food. Uh, so there was hardly any calories getting burned. And we went about, oh, three days on half rice. Like, it's Matterhorn. Uh, exaggerates it, what actually happened to me by about three days. But uh, we really, I really did have an operation where we were on half rations for, you know, about a week and then no food at all for about five days. 
and it was on that operation that, and it was wet. I mean, we were up at about four or 5,000 feet and everybody thinks, oh, Vietnam hot. Uh-uh, Vietnam, rainy, cold, really bad up in the mountains. And uh, I got hypothermia and I, I started shivering uncontrollably. And uh, it was like, there's, everything was wet. There was, no, there was no place to get warm. And Thomas just uh, took his poncho liner out and came down on the ground with me and wrapped himself around me. And uh, I mean, it, it still to this day almost brings tears to my eyes. He, he heated me up with his own body heat. Uh, and I got out of it and came, and uh, I'm alive to this day because of it. Uh, and I made Thomas a, a squad leader. Um, Again, I don't know if it's the same in the army, but probably in combat, you don't. The ranks after a while is way less important than the competence. And even though he was only a lance corporal, I put him in charge of a, of a squad, and then promoted him to corporal. <laughs> but uh, uh, and I, I write about this and what it's like. I, I, uh, and it's one of these things about being a you know, a commander in combat, you make these decisions and sometimes you, you really regret them. Um, I had, we were to take a hill and I knew by that time I was pretty savvy that when the enemy left, because there was no doubt that we were going to take the hill, um, they would go down a certain ridge line. And so I wanted Thomas to go set up an ambush there and, and, um, kill them all when they came off the top of the hill. I was I was pretty bloodthirsty, and uh, we broke through a line of bunkers, and I could see that the NDA were were starting to leave. They never ran. I mean, I have utter respect for that army. They, they always retreated in complete order, but they were heading down that ridge line, and Thomas wasn't there yet. And I started shouting at him on the radio. Where in the hell are you? Got to get in position. They're leaving now. God damn it. You, you know, I mean, the typical lieutenant. And he was taking his time because he had to stay under cover in the jungle. And there had been parts of it that had been burned away by napalm. And in order to make better time, he broke cover from the jungle so he could get to the ambush site on time with his squad. As soon as he broke cover from the jungle, I saw three RPGs. <laughs> hit his squad and killed him and break. And uh, to this day, I wonder why I was so bloodthirsty. I mean, I mean, so they were leaving, you know, just let them go for Christ's sake. But I, God damn it, wanted to kill him. You know, I mean, I just, that's, you get into that. Um, and uh, the guy who I call P-Dog, uh, um, his name is Warner and they called him Worm. That was because same reason he, he had saved his squad by crawling around. Uh, but Worm packed Thomas up to me because we were we were consolidating the hill and digging in for defenses in case there was a counterattack. And he just dumped him at my feet, just dumped him, thud. And there's dead Thomas, the guy that saved my life. Uh, and I went through his pockets, you know, as you have to do. And there's a letter from his mother that said, I'll never forget it. it said, well, Butch, only 16 more days and you'll be home. Uh, I mean, he, I didn't even know his name was Butch. I, I mean, he was just Thomas. Um, and I was, I felt guilty about that for years. Uh, I mean, I was at a, I was at a, a reunion just two or three years ago of the, of the, of the company and Warner was there. And I said, Warner, I've always felt bad about how I think you were so angry at me for forcing the, your squad to break cover. And you just dumped Thomas at my feet and walked away. And I apologized. And he looked at me, he said, sir, I was just tired. <laughs> <You know? laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I still regret that I was bloodthirsty, but in, in, in what it's like, I do write about this incredible experience of the Mass for the Dead, where I actually talked to Thomas, and I believe I did contact him in some way, and 
I said, I'm sorry that I, I'm, I was shouting at you to break cover. And I know it, it got you killed because you were just trying to do what, what, what I asked. And his answer was, hell, Lieutenant, I'm a Marine too. I wanted to kill him too. You know, see, so the story of Thomas is sort of like, you know, very poignant for me because he saved my life. But it's also instructive is that what you think is going on in someone else's head isn't exactly what's going on in someone else's head. You never know. And you can rightfully feel guilty about stupid decisions, but you don't have to accept the full responsibility because these other people are involved too. And they're, they're individual characters. It's like Thomas said, he wanted to kill him too. It wasn't, wasn't just me. And, and, uh, uh, and like I said, the funny one was Warner dumping him in front of me and, and walking away. And for, for 40 years, I felt like he was angry at me. <laughs> Hell, Lieutenant, I was just tired. <laughs> oh, yeah. I appreciate you sharing that story. And I know he meant a lot. And and the things that I've seen that you, uh, when you talk about him, and, and for anybody that's a platoon leader or a commander that has an RTO and I, I've heard several different leaders that talk about the value of what a radio does for a leader in combat. You know, you can bring maneuver on, you know, integrate fires. You can call in medevac. So the value of an RTO and, you know, at the same time, that that, that poor soul is carrying so much equipment. You know, he's got the heavier ruck and he's got the challenge to make sure that every time that you need something, whoever, you know, that, that line when he when you push to talk, it, the the individual that is responsible on the other or the, the individual he's trying to reach on the other line you know he he's holding that responsibility to make sure that you can communicate and, and it made me take pause and 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 when I when I heard you talked about that just go through my own personal experience about the value of of RTOs where a lot of times you know they they hear a lot from a lieutenant or a platoon leader that's kind of going through in their own mind a little bit about a stress about trying to get after the maneuver aspect of it. <clears throat> and they're the first ones that'll pull out a poncho line and wrap their arms around you to make sure the Lieutenant's straight, you know, and yep. it's, and, and, and I, and I appreciate it because it was really, you, I, I, I took it as you, he wasn't just your RTO that was taking care of to make sure you could communicate. He was taking care of you. Totally. Yeah, no, he was he, he, a, a wonderful human being. I, uh, at, at this reunion, I met his sister. It was really she. She she came to the reunion to see Thomas's friends, and we had a good long talk. You know, it was really quite moving. I, I appreciate you sharing that, sir. And I I know for those that have been um, in combat that have have had you know special relationships like that is you know it is it is cathartic when you go back to those reunions and you celebrate those that you know, have gone through the crucible of ground combat and uh, have, have given the ultimate sacrifice. And, and, and I can empathize at the same time, you know, as the, as the leader that's responsible, you know, for the mission. And, and you know deep down inside that a lot of times your soldiers have utmost trust in you when you tell them to move or to assault or to clear, you know, or knock out this bunker. They're going to move. They're, they're going to trust that you're going to bring everything to bear to make sure. And, and, and I was just talking with a, a previous guest that was a, you know, a mentor of mine. And we just talked about the value of, of why we train, you know, so, so hard to continue to get after this repetition repetitions, you know, and to make sure that the, that the moment that, you know, you're there, you understand and you can see things faster and, and, and more clear. So you can make sure before you send the first element out there to conduct that clearance that you're ready to go. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that you also have to accept you're not going to get it right all the time. And you're human. I think one of the, I don't know, I've talked to a, a woman who's, uh, she was my VA psych, psychologist and a really together woman. And she said, officers have a particular problem with guilt after, you know, when they're veterans and are talking to people like her, because they have this idea that if they don't perform perfectly, then they're bad. And that's from the training like you're talking about. So you have to also understand that yes, you want to perform perfectly because if you don't, people die, but you're never gonna be 
perfect. You're just never going to do it. So don't use that standard when you judge yourself. I have to judge myself. You know, I was 23. The, the blood was up. I wanted to kill him. Uh, yeah, I accept that. I'm not perfect. And that helped because if I had said, well, I'm a good Christian. I shouldn't have wanted to kill him like that. I should have let him go. I mean, no, nah, I mean, yeah, that's a standard that I'm sorry, I can't meet. And so being, I think it's being a little humble about the fact that, yeah, you're going to tell kids, and they are mostly 19, 18 year olds, to do things that'll get them killed. And sometimes you probably could have said something else and they would have gotten the mission done without getting killed. Oops. Yeah. Hmm. Well, you just have to accept if you don't like that kind of responsibility, don't go in the infantry. <laughs> you know, that's not the place for you. I, I appreciated that you, 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 uh, you also mentioned that when I, when I saw um, the interview and you talked about owning the responsibility, I think that was the first step of, kind of going through this, the, the recovery aspect and, and acceptance. But at the same point, too, you know, as you hear, even up to this time, you know, I, I know from my own personal experiences, decisions that I have, I have made that I've owned, I've come back and I've said, these are the five decisions I know I made on this. Um, and, and knowing that they involved, you know, soldiers getting injured and soldiers getting killed, these are the same five decisions that I would still make today based on what I understood, you know, and, and you're right. And, you know, you could probably run it through some AI, you know, some some algorithm, and there might be a chance that there is no casualties. But at the moment, that's the human factor that you have. Right. And, and I appreciate that you're willing to share and be honest with it. And, and I think that's part of the thing about being a leader. If you can openly say, hey, I made that decision based on what I, you know, what I felt was right, what I understood, um, and I own that, and here were the results – you're going to see that a different level of respect and they're going to see that on you. And, and I think your soldiers and your other leaders and your peers will wrap their arms around you. No, I think you're absolutely right. It's, it's that, that honesty about yourself, they'll sniff it out if you're not. I mean, you know, someone once said, uh, I was, I was talking to a, a young woman who, who was just leaving the, the, the basic school and she said, well, what, what do I do? How do I, how do I, you know, talk to my new platoon and, and everything? I said, the one thing that, that you don't have to worry about is that they'll give you about 15 seconds and they'll either decide you're going to be the leader or you're not. I mean, so it'll be over within about 15 seconds. Well, my God, what do I do? I said, you have to be yourself. And if you go there trying to be somebody you're not, I mean, what's the, what's the old adage? They can, they have a bullshit detector that'll detect a cow fart at a thousand meters. You know, that's true. That's you true. cannot bullshit the troops. You cannot. If you do, you're doomed. I mean, they'll work for you, but they won't work for you like they were. They will for a real person. And uh, uh, I think that that's another important lesson about leadership is, is it, you're who you are. You're, you're, you're not perfect, but uh, you, you, you're going to try the best you can. And I think that, that they'll, they'll detect it. They'll see it. You, you know, sir, I think just in the story of Thomas, it, it, and really why it resonated with me when I was when I was watching it and I was reading about it is that it, uh, I, I think it encapsulates what we're trying to promote, facilitate when we talk about building a warrior culture, and and I, I've heard you mention a couple of times, right? So we 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 ramp these individuals up, we ramp these soldiers up in building lethality and readiness and we we give them the reps to do the things that they need to do as they potentially end up facing things on the battlefield but then as you have had all these experiences and you could share i know you know unpack several lessons learned about preparation and what you learned throughout the war and the numerous vignettes that i know that you've weaved in through your books but then there's this portion about coming back and then it's the second portion of it this is the di dichotomy of you know, how do you unpack what you experienced and the, and the human mind has, has, has seen and experienced and, and, and to keep your humanity. And, and I've heard you say, you know, some people paint, some people, you know, they, they, you know, create music. And then, and in your case, some people write. And, you know, we had a previous guest that, that talked about, you know, this warrior culture and, he said it was this book of the book of five rings, Miyamoto uh, Musashi. And he talked about this, this, this great samurai warrior 
ended up having to, you know, like 60 duels. And in order to, to have respect and, and to be able to, to be at peace for what he needed to do when he was going through that, he had to do these other things that kept him, you know, it kept him human, <clears throat> painting, you know, tending to a garden and all this. And then, you know, one of the guests we recently had that I, you know, it was, it was just awesome to hear the same portion of it. You know, how do you go through, you know, a 400-day deployment that has one of the most storied, significant contacts in the global war on terror, you know, presidential unit citation, over 400 Valor Awards, three Medal of Honor recipients. And, and he goes, you know, one, I, I, everything I do is about the respect of people. I care for people. I don't hate anybody. Um, and he goes, and, that, and that, that one portion of that helps me understand. He goes, and he made a very, very telling point. He's like, and you know me. He goes, you know me, John. He goes, I don't allow any cheering, clapping, any of that stuff when, it's in, you know, when we're in a jock. It doesn't matter if it's a kinetic strike. It doesn't matter if it's excessive of what we've done on a raid. It's still that respect. And when he was saying that, that resonated the same thing that I heard from this lesson. And, you know, when I heard your story when you were talking about Thomas, and then, you know, later on when you were talking about coming out of the war and, you know, you, you're running into some, some other college students that are giving you a hard time as you're wearing your uniform as you're walking down Pennsylvania Avenue, you know, or when you are eventually tell this young lady who you, you kind of like that you were a Marine and she flips out. And then you, you, you don't realize once you experience these things over there and as a very young leader that at some point some of these things are going to have to get unpackaged. And, and how you do that, if you don't have some type of outlet, whether you're trying to celebrate those by surrounding yourself with the same individuals that went through this experience, but at the same time exercise some of these hobbies, as you mentioned, art, music, writing, that'll help you go through that. And so I was I I have a friend, to share that. his name is Joe Bobro, and he, he crystallized it for, for me. Because I was talking to him about I was writing, and Joe is a he's like a zen buddhist sort of i don't know what you call him very 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 conscious person and and he said it's it's like this he says you're changing ghosts into ancestors and you probably have heard me say this before but the if it's inside of you it haunts it's a ghost and it haunts you that's what's going to get you into a bar fight that's what's going to get you divorced. That's what's going to get you screaming at your kids. All those things are because these experiences that you've had affect you. And the more you push them down inside, the, where you're not aware of them, they're going to haunt you. That's, so how do you get it outside of you? How do you turn it into an ancestor? You get it out in front of you where you can look at it. And that's what the piece of art is. That's what the writing is. That's what the music is. Uh, is that you take that ghost that's been haunting you and you put it out in front of you and make it conscious. It'll never go away. I mean, that experience is the experience you had. And believe me, some of the things that I did in the war, I wish I hadn't done. But when I get out, get it out and look at it, it doesn't compel me to do really bad things today. <laughs> you know, I, 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 I can look at it as an ancestor as part of my makeup but it's not haunting me because I've tried to repress it. Uh, and I think that it's an important concept, ghosts to ancestors. And, and there's many ways of turning your ghosts into ancestors. I mean, including, you know, just talking with your wife about it. I mean, you think that'd be something everybody does, but I, I guarantee you that 80% of veterans come back and never say a word to their wives about what, any of that stuff. Sir, for, for you, after experience and everything you had in the, in the time frame of being a, a junior leader during the time in, in Vietnam, how do you make that transition? And if you could share with the team as you came back, and as I, I highlighted, you know, just in that small experience, you know, you started recognizing you were experiencing something different in a, in a place that probably not many understood really what was going on and saw you as representative of something different. And, and I was wondering if you could kind of share you know, what you were experiencing and, and how did you go through that and move on from there? Yeah, um, it was a very rocky time. And, and uh, I think it was a shameful time in America. Uh, we came back from the war and, and we were basically blamed for what was in fact uh, some bad foreign policy. And, you know, clearly it wasn't our fault. 
at that time you couldn't even vote when you when you were 18. Um, and uh, the incident you're talking about, I, I, I was at the Pentagon and I had to carry some papers over to the White House and and so I'm trucking down to Pennsylvania Avenue, I think it was, and right right out in front of the White House. Uh, and I'm in my uniform and across the street is a bunch of kids uh, waving North Vietnamese flags, Viet Cong flags, and sh call it shouting names and obscenities at me. And I remember just being stunned. I mean, it's like, and I, I have this image of them across the street and me on the other side in my uniform. And I knew that if I even took a step across the street, there'd be, you know, the Washington Post would have Marine officer attack students or some damn thing like that. And the other thing that I remember is people walking past me on the sidewalk, averting their eyes from the situation. There was nobody wanted to step in and say, come on, kids. I mean, this guy's not, didn't, didn't the guy in the White House is responsible for the policy. Um, and I couldn't reach across that gap. I couldn't reach across that, that street. And I think that unconsciously, it was a large motivator in Matterhorn. It's just trying to tell our story because they don't understand. They do not understand what we've gone through. And the other thing is that, that did occur to me is they, one, of the, one of the expressions back then was baby killers. And, uh, and I remember thinking that, you know, the kids that you're calling baby killers are younger than you are. They're all, they didn't get to go to college. They were 18 and 19. And these were college kids, clearly, you know, probably 22 years old, 21 years old. So all that was, was going through my head. And uh, didn't know what to do with it. I stuffed it. You know, good, good strategy. Finished my job. And the other incident, which was a terrible incident, was, was, I, I, was I was actually going to my brother's wedding. And if you wore your uniform, you could get half price tickets on trains and stuff. And so I had my uniform on and, and I on the train at, uh, in Washington, D.C. Got on a train and there was this good looking woman, some years older than me, probably all 25. But uh, and I and you, know, you go through that typical thing. Well, God, the seat next to her is empty. Oh, God, if I sit next to her, she'll think I'm being forward. Oh, I better not. Well, maybe if I sit over here, I can look at her. And, you know, Anyway, our eyes met, and she looked at me, and she looked back down, and I went to the back of the train car. And as the train was rolling along after about 20 minutes, uh, it was dark outside, windows, I remember the windows were dark. And she came walking down the aisle toward me, and, and at first I thought, wow, she's coming down, and then I could see something on her face. It was like, this is not going to be good. And she came down, stood right in front of me, and spit on me. And it... I think she was aiming for my face and hit my ribbons. And I can't tell you how stunned I was by that. Uh, embarrassed. And again, everybody else in the train just looked at their newspapers. Nobody said a word. And uh, she went back up the aisle and I just got up from my seat and went to the other, down the other direction. I, I, was, I, was, I, was, I can't tell you how, how stunned I was by that kind of a reception and and i've had to deal with it a lot and one of the things that i've come up with is that they don't understand they don't there's no way that you can get them to understand uh unless they go through it themselves but think of this analogy half of the world can't have babies all right i don't understand what it's like to have to bear a child. I mean, it's obviously painful. And it's obviously an experience that's beyond me. But all the women I know don't hold it against me. See, it's, it's like it's not my fault that I don't understand them. And they accept it. And I think that the way a veteran has to accept it is you just have to say it's the same thing. I mean, if all the women in the world held it against the men because they don't know what it's like to have a baby, we'd be in a very sad place. You're coming back. Like you said, we're less than 1% of the population. I mean, you have to carry a pretty big chip on your shoulder to fight 99% of the world. And quite frankly, I see a lot of guys coming back with that chip on their shoulder, which is like, I've been in combat. You don't know what the fuck you're doing. You don't know shit. I, I understand the hardness. I mean, you know this, you know this, this, this shtick. Uh, you, you've never been where I am. 
I'm superior to you. There is the rub. You're not superior to them. Just like, you know, the woman's not superior to the man because she happened to bear a child. She's had a different experience and it's a profound experience. But if we don't, as veterans, understand that that experience that we've had is our experience, not, not the civilians, and you have to just get off your high horse, otherwise you are going to be isolated from them. You, you can't communicate with them if, if you think you're superior to them. It's, and it's hard because I, I often go through that sort of like, you don't know shit. You know, I mean, you know what? I mean, I, I, I'm not fooling anybody. You know that feeling. You don't, and and you got to get over it. It's like, no, they don't know, but that doesn't make make them less than you are or you better than they are. Because if you have that experience or that feeling about it, you're you're going to be isolated the rest of your life, and no one's going to reach in and help you. I'm sorry, you got to get that one out on your own, and uh, that took me a while. Uh, to to come to that understanding, um, but that's where I am today. How long did it take you to to write Matterhorn? Well, it's an interesting story. I I I I wrote the first draft in first person. You know, I did this, I did that, and it was terrible. And it took I did it in about three months. Uh, and I went away with a girlfriend of mine. We went to Ireland, and I said, geez, novel writing is easy. I'd get this sucker done in three months, you know, and I came back and I started reading it. And it was just crap. It was terrible. I mean, it was awful. And so I thought, well, I better learn something. So I went and got books and, and several years later, I've been reading about how to develop characters and how to develop plots. And, and I rewrote the entire thing in third person, which is the, what it is now. So I mean, the whole thing was rewritten again. And so I started, started in 1972 and uh, by the end of the 70s, I had, I had it all done, like 77. So four, four more years, about, uh, maybe five, I had finished it. And um, I couldn't get it published. I mean, I can't tell you how many rejection letters I had. It's like, I mean, you know, it's about a war that we lost and nobody wants to hear about it. Everybody's sick of Vietnam. And that was in the 70s. And in the 80s, uh, you know, it was, I would get letters from you know, New York publishers and agents. Well, you know, Hollywood's already done Vietnam, full metal jacket and apocalypse now. And now nah, it's a dead subject. Nobody wants to read about it. And, and in the nineties, I literally got letters from people saying, uh, and in the aughts, it's like, well, this about this Marine unit in, in, in Vietnam. Well, it's not relevant. Why don't you just, I mean, it's the same thing. Why don't you just take these guys and put them on a hill in Afghanistan. And then you'd have a novel we might consider publishing. I mean, it went on for, so it wasn't how long it took me to write it. It was how long it took me to get it published, 35 years. Uh, and, uh, and I kept working on it. I mean, one of the things, quite frankly, that the, the first draft just skipped around was the racism. I mean, I was afraid to touch it, not because I, I didn't think it was a worthy subject, but because I thought, what do I know about that experience? I'm not African American. I mean, I grew up in a town where racial tension was at the labor temple after the dances, and the Finns would square off against the Swedes and Norwegians. That was racial tension where I grew up, you know. So I, there were no African Americans within 100 miles of my town, um, and so I was a little reluctant. But I realized that you can't write about the Vietnam War or that whole period in American history without touching racism, you wouldn't be honest. And so that got added because it got rejected so many times, but I kept working on it, vacations. And, and finally around 2009 is when, when it got published by this tiny little house in Berkeley, California called LEO and Literary Arts. And then it got picked up by New York and then I was an overnight success. <laughs> That's amazing. Cause as you, as you talk about it, it's, it's about telling your story. It's about closing the gap. Yeah, yeah, it's about crossing the street. Absolutely. Yeah. And I can't tell you, it, it's been satisfying. I've had several, I remember this one guy came with me, he had, he had five books that he had bought. It was, I was at a book signing and I'm at the table and he puts the five books down. He says, would you please sign all these books? And I said, wow, I said, five books. He said, I said, that's great. And he said, yeah, he says, I've got four kids and a, and a wife. And he said, um, I've been trying to tell them about my experience in Vietnam for years, and I, I can't get it out. I choke up. I go, I go camping. I, I, I disappear. I come back. I, I, I can't. 
I'm going to just let them read this book and it's going to explain this, my story to them. And I thought, you know, I did speak a bit for those guys that have trouble articulating their, their stories. And, and I wanted very much to articulate the story of just the common young kid. And I think I was the first guy to call them kids in print. You know, I mean, I got a lot of flack about that. And I just said, they're kids, get over it. <laughs> you know, but in fact, in fact, if, if they weren't kids, they wouldn't be as effective. I've always said this about grunts is that you don't want 35 year olds. I mean, yeah, you need 35 year olds in special forces or police or, you know, those are different things, but you got to take the hill. You don't want a 35 year old say, well, Lieutenant, gee, well, can we call the air force and just have them, you know, bomb it for three days? What, what are we going to do? 18 year olds will not ask that question. They'll just take the hill. That's what, that's why you want them. I mean, you know, and the infantry officer has to understand they're an asset because they're so young. They're God, they go without food and water for days. They do it. You tell them they don't even think. I mean, the cerebral cortex, when is it? You're like 23 before the cerebral cortex clicks in. You're the cerebral cortex of the, of the platoon, basically. And, you know, talk about responsibility. <laughs> That's right. That's right. The, so, you know, it, that's incredible because I think a lot of people, you know, you, you've heard about Matterhorn and, and, their, and that book gets referenced a lot now because, you know, now we're going over a decade. So those that are serving in, in this position as platoon leader, I know some of you know, a lot of people have referenced them to them. In fact, you know, a, a lot of, you know, previous guests, you know, we'll have some leaders, you know, watch some of our, our, our previous, you know, podcasts and then we'll ask them for a recommendation and your name has come up several times. As, as the author for, uh, for Matterhorn, what was harder to write? Was it Matterhorn or what it's like to go to war? Uh, what it's like to go to war was harder yeah. because I had to get honest with yeah. myself. Uh, you know, Matterhorn is fictional characters and obviously they're all parts of myself, but I didn't have to, you know, I, I always could hide behind the fact that, well, I made him up. I mean, it wasn't really me. Exactly. Well, when I wrote it, uh, what it's like it was really me and and there were se several times and I even wrote about it in the book where I found myself writing sometimes a day or two down some path and realizing it was just bullshit I mean I was just it's amazing how easy we are it is to kid ourselves and I was writing stuff that basically wasn't true and I had to I had to sit down and throw it out and say, this is wrong. This is not right. This isn't really what happened. Now, what really happened and how did I really feel about it? I had to face all that. And so that was a lot, a lot harder. Um, it was also harder to write a smaller book. <laughs> There's a wonderful quote. I mean, I don't know if you've heard this Lord Chesterfield, who is a wonderful letter writer. And in one of the letters to his sons, he says, uh, I'd have written you a shorter letter, but I didn't have time. No, oh, that's, that's great. I, I think that's, you know, I was fascinated by that story. I think you were telling um, you same thing, you know, you, you had met somebody and you wanted to tell this young lady that you're a Marine and the moment you did, she, she kind of freaked out. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. She, it was a, she it was when I was in England and, and she was studying D.H. Lawrence at, at uh, uh, University of London and I was quite taken by her uh, and you know it, and after a couple of dates uh, we we're sitting at the bottom of the stairs to her flat and I thought well maybe I better tell her at some point it's got to come out and so I said I, I said well you know I was a marine in Vietnam and she literally stood up just stood up on the stairs and 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 said oh my god they're the worst and turned around and went up the stairs and I never saw her again you know that's a that's a tough way to break up <laughs> <laughs> but that gives you an idea of what you're up against you know I mean it's like they, she didn't have a clue she didn't have a clue um, if you, maybe if you yeah. told her you were in the army, she would have stayed. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. <laughs> uh, yeah, maybe. <laughs> Wait, sir, you know, I, I love the fact that, you know, you, you've walked us through this portion about talking a little bit about your background and going through this. And, and I know a lot of your story talks about, you know, a, 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 a younger portion of your life 
But, you know, as, as you've even mentioned, when people ask you, would you have done it again? And, and I, I really want, you know, our team that listens or will get a chance to listen to this is the experiences that you had during that time were not just, you know, impactful for you professionally, but also personally. And, and just in this journey, as you just talk about with Matterhorn, but or even, you know, what it's like to go to war, um, and, and it's, it's also very cathartic. As, as we've talked about, and, and, and I want those that are, that are listening to your story that you're also living, you know, the example of the warrior culture. I mean, and you've been able to come back and, you know, as we were joking around as being a Christmas baby or Christmas Eve baby, you know, um, the, one of my mentors that we were talking with the other day, he said, you know, life's not fair, but, you know, the same thing applies with death. Death is not fair. And so, you know, I may look at the end of this thing and, and say, hey, I, I had X number of years in combat. But then again, I go back and I look at, you know, this this private, he had six hours. And now I'm sitting in here and, you know, I get to spend, you know, Christmas with all three of my sons, you know, as I'm walking through. And so people will ask me very similarly, uh, you were asked, would you do this again? And, and it gives you a different perspective. And I just think it's it's great to see, you know, you got to get outside from yourself, but it's continuing along this thing that we talk about, you know, and from the beginning, this calling, going along this journey, the profession of arms. And and I love that the fact that even though that you're, uh, you know, you're, you're the spring chicken age of, you know, 75, you're really still, you know, pursuing being a steward of paying it back. So, you know, for the for a young leader that hasn't gone to combat yet, they can hear your story and understand and take away some key principles. You know, they can take away some things about preparation, about personal thoughts through some of these characters, and even what, it, what it's like to go to war and, and listen to the things about some of the anxieties, you know, and say, hey, this, what I'm going through is actually natural. And then the same portion about when you come back. And, and I appreciate because, you know, we've gone through this and I've lived through this, you know, after 20 years, those that I that I, I, I looked at and I, I stood on the shoulders of and just watched them in awe of some of the things they have done during the global war on terror. I've seen them go through in the transition and had their own personal challenges. As you've talked about ghosts, you know, I've heard the same term used as demons. And, and we've been trained to compartmentalize those. We've been trained to place those, you know, in parts where we don't talk about. And, and, and I really appreciate, as you said, you know, if you go, you, if you, you got to find a way to get them in front of you so you can address them. And, and that goes back to that second portion of what we talk about, the music, the art, the writing it down, the part that keeps you human. And, and I think that's the most critical piece in, in this discussion, that if you can figure that out early enough, as you did, kind of transitioning out, and maybe it was, and, and I hate it that you had to go through, you know, the experience on the train or, you know, college kids that had no understanding of what you went through and the sacrifice and, and, the, and the loss and the experiences that you, you know, you endured while you were there. But you realize that, and again, it was an opportunity as this, this calling to, hey, I need to close the gap, cross the street, share the story. And it's not just for them. As you say, now it's 2009, 2010, you know, 2020. You're sharing that story, and you're teaching another generation. So I thank you, sir. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Well, hey, sir, I, I really appreciate that you you took the time to sit down. A, a, a great conversation. And I know you're not that far in, in the midst of, you know, all this, this uh, unique challenges that we've had in 2020. We'd love to have you come down and see the Lancer Brigade. Um, and, and get a chance for you to really meet, you know, the, the best and brightest and showcase our junior leaders. And you can really share a lot more of your experiences. And, and, and as you see the things that we deal with and the open, openness and the transparency and a lot of the things that we're trying to do to make sure that we're creating this warrior culture, not just this war culture, as you talked about in the beginning about this career of how we prepare for the crucible of ground combat. You know, there's something different when you're doing this thing called the profession of arms. And our, and our listeners that are go through this, we always leave them, you know, with the tagline of what are your questions, but I'd like to leave the final word with you, sir. Well, I guess the final word is, is that, you know, what, 
everybody, and you'd ask some questions, written them down. Uh, no one was wanted to take responsibility for them, but uh, the question of meaning. You could, everybody's life has to have meaning, and I think that what warriors have to understand is that they work for politicians, unless they're in a dictatorship, uh, in which case they're assassins and they're not warriors. And you cannot hang your hat for meaning on what the politicians have decided you're to do. I mean, if you're in World War II and you whoop fascism, oh, that's good. And if you're in the Vietnam War and it's like oh, a little problematical, that's not so good, you know. And uh, that's not where you're going to hang your hat for meaning. Where's the meaning in this profession? The meaning in this profession is what does it do for your soul? What does it do for your own development? When you look back on what you did in combat, how you behaved and all that, you can't say I did it to save uh, you know, Iraq from uh, whoever it was, <laughs> Saddam Hussein, because it didn't work out, did it? No, it didn't work out. No, I mean, and, and so, whoops, that's not where I have to look for it. You have to always be looking toward, in my opinion, the development of your soul, your consciousness. And that's where the guidance is and that's where the meaning is. If you can come back and say, I'm a better person, I'm a bigger person, I'm a deeper person because of this experience, that is meaning. You can't come back and say, I saved Iraq from a dictator. Uh, I mean, come on. <laughs> Every 18 year old that's been over there can tell you that that is crap, you know, and so don't go there. Uh, don't kid yourself. Look, look elsewhere and then you won't go wrong. Hey, sir. I, well said. I'd really appreciate it. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. Nice talking to you. Thank you for listening to the leadership experience. If you like what you heard, follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and don't forget to subscribe to keep up to date with the newest podcast. The Leadership Experience will showcase professionals within five different subseries. Number one, Masters of Our Craft, The Essence of Warfighting. Number two, Students of Our Profession, as we understand organizational culture and concepts of leadership. Number three, Professional Athletes with Guns, as we talk hardships and maintaining a competitive advantage. Number four, Grit and Resiliency, the ability to overcome and perform under pressure. And number five, safe and secure environment as we talk soldier well-being and building trust within their organization and the profession as whole.